In this video, we cross into the Bolivian high plains, known as the Altiplano, to a landscape that feels otherworldly with coloured lakes, geothermal activity and extremely interesting wildlife. We cruise out into this surreal landscape in a four-wheel drive Jeep, ready to tackle the bumpy terrain of this remote area and get a glimpse of rural Bolivian life and agricultural farming practices. After staying overnight in a hotel made of salt, we awaken early for a spectacular sunrise over the world's largest salt flat. Here we explore this massive white expanse and have some fun playing around with the perspective shots. We explore some famous sites on the flats and visit a scrapyard where trains come to rest in their eternal peace. Join us as we explore the Bolivian Altiplano and the Iuni Salt Flats. We continue from our previous video where we travelled from central to northern Chile, from its capital to the world's highest and driest desert. Altiplano. We've just crossed into Bolivia. Had a few complications crossing over the border. One, Miranda had some issues with her American dollars for her visa. Apparently they need to be very neat. And luckily enough, there were a couple of Brazilians that were having a trade with Miranda for some really clean nose. But the other problem is we weren't aware that you actually need uh, Boliviano pesos to get into the national parks here. Where, whereas we thought they were all included on our tour, we didn't get enough information on the tour. So luckily enough, we've been able to borrow some money off people on the tour, including our driver slash guide. But our first stop here is Laguna Blanca, which means the White Lake, you can kind of see. And uh, the reason why it's white is because of a type of L element known as borox that comes from the volcanic mountains surrounding us here. We also saw some vicuñas as well, which are a wild species of alpaca or llama, uh, similar to the guanacos that we saw down in Pan Patagonia, but these are a little bit different. So we're hiding behind the car out of the wind right now because my GoPro is out of battery. But where are we, Miranda? We are at Laguna Verde. And what? Yeah. Absolutely stunning. Apparently gets its color from arsenic. Arsenic. And verde for the uh, non-Spanish speakers? Green. It's yes, the green lake. Green lake. Exactly. Exactly. Are you feeling good now, Miranda? I actually feel great. She feels great. You're in the Altiplano. Yeah. You're feeling great because of the lack of oxygen. No, that's not the reason why. <laughs> a little bit of high, maybe. <laughs> yeah, Miranda had a very stressful morning with the, uh, yeah, the visa I process. I thought I wasn't going to get into Bolivia. Yeah, she was so. just very upset. Thank you for something. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Everyone's helped us out so far. <laughs> I'm a bit unprepared, I feel. I'm off camera. It's, it's kind of weird talking while you're off camera, but this is us in Laguna Verde. Uh, Josemar, our driver, he said that this is his favorite lake in the Alta Plano. Mine, last time I was here, nine years ago in 2014, was Laguna, Colorado, and that's because of the flamingos. We've already seen one. We're looking forward to seeing a lot more. Our driver just said we're at 4,500 meters above sea level. In the background there, you can see Likang Kabur. Something like that. Yeah. So I guess we're pretty safe with... Uh... Before not too long, we come across a desert landscape said to resemble the work of a famous Spanish surrealist artist. 
So this is the famous Salvador Dali desert. Um, I'm pretty sure that the Surrealist painter uh, created some works of art here or based on this desert landscape. Oh, also there's some these dust devils around here too, so they're kind of like tornadoes. You see them uh, with the wind sort of kicking up the dust and spinning around. here at the Natural Geothermal Springs. I have no idea how warm this is going to be, to be honest. Ooh. Ooh. Okay, there's my shower for tonight, or my bath for tonight. Oh, it's really hot. Oh. Oh. Oh, here's the jiggy. What do you think? Oh, it's really warm. It's really hot. Oh my goodness. Oh, that's so warm. Go on. Yeah, dunk your head. Yes, no. I think I want to, I think I want to do a dunk. Guys, paparazzi is actually here now. <laughs> so we have Tina, Saskia, and Tristan. This is our this is our team for the Altiplano and yeah. Saladia Uno. Oh, oh, Turuku. Turuku. Oh, yeah. Ah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's the highest volcano in the, in the region. Oh, is it really? Yeah. Tristan is your new guide now. <laughs> Who will be taking over? <laughs> okay, I'm taking the Bolivianos. <laughs> <laughs> well, we don't have any, so that's a bit of a problem. <laughs> bunch of uh, volcanic geysers that are in this area here. Uh, I think I was back here in 2014 and I just realized I have a photograph of myself here at these geysers wearing the exact same alpaca sweater that I, I had back then. I bought that on the same trip in Peru back in 2014, nine years ago. So this just lasts me all that time. We arrive at the Laguna, Colorado, my favorite lake from my previous trip in 2014. Famous not only for its vibrant colors, but also its abundant population of flamingos. Among these, three out of the six world species of flamingos are present, including the Chilean, Andean, and the James's flamingo in the highest numbers. The James's flamingo is the world's rarest flamingo, only found in the high Andean plateaus and was thought to be extinct until a small population was rediscovered in 1956. Lagoon gets its red colour from the abundance of plankton in its waters. The plankton feed on microscopic algae high in carotenoids, the same natural pigment that makes carrots orange and tomatoes red. This abundance of plankton draws in the flamingos in high numbers and in turn also gives them their pink colour.
up here is Laguna Colorada. So it's the colored lagoon and it's famous for its flamingos, which have this beautiful pink color due to the color of the bacteria in the lagoon itself that they feed upon. So we did see some flamingos earlier that were white in different lagoons. So these ones are a little bit different, but there are thousands of them. And we also saw some alpacas as well. Local domesticated alpacas can be seen decorated with color ribbons attached to their ears so that their owner can identify who the herd belongs to. We retire to a nearby village overnight where dinner is prepared for us, the traditional Bolivian dish of salchipapa consisting of fries, beef, sausage, egg and salad. Delicious way to end the day. Our guide told us to pack some summer clothes because it's going to be a warm day. We're heading straight to a desert called Saloli Desert where we will observe the stone tree, which is apparently a stone shaped like a tree. Pretty cool. And then afterwards we head to a bunch of lagoons and then go to the salt flats where we'll be staying in a salt hostel. So quite cool. I'm excited. <laughs> about to leave the small pueblito or small village so we're just having a little walk around before we leave this is where we stayed last night So behind me here we have La Copa del Mundo, the World Cup from the soccer. Tristan over here is from France, so it's a, it's a very sore subject for him. <laughs> it's pretty cool, it's a beautiful area. So behind me here we have the camel rock. So it looks like a camel. I've just uh, had an accident with my drone. It didn't slow down when I went to catch it and it sliced my finger. Luckily we had some uh, people on hand, which uh, one of which was a nurse, or a doctor I should say. She uh, was able to fix me right up and uh, good to go. So apparently we have some quinoa here. Oh yeah. That's pretty cool. Oh yeah. And, and you can see that they've been cultivating it too. You've got the lines there. And... I climb a high cliff to get a bird's eye view of the area known as Italia Perdita, or Lost Italy, said to resemble Roman ruins from high above.
lunch, we visit a place full of domesticated llamas or llamas. In Spanish, llama means to call or is called and can create an enjoyable amount of confusion when asking people what they are called. Carlos, okay. tengo una pregunta. Si? Sí. Como se llama este animal? <laughs> In español. Llama, llama sería tal vez. Llama? Llama. Pero, como se llama? <laughs> se llama. El llama, el llama. So in Spanish, the llama, because the double L is pronounced llama. So this is what I've been asking the driver all day and driving him crazy. This is cool. These villages are great too. They basically have these quinoa crops everywhere that they're growing and they're herding the, the llamas. So um, yeah, it's just like real sort of Andean rural feel. Llamas and alpacas are domesticated in large numbers in the area, as they are adapted and suited to the harsh conditions of the high Andes. Not too distant relatives of the camels in North Africa and Asia, local farmers and communities depend on these animals for their wool production and meat. The nearby ponds in Laguna Negra are teeming with bird life, a rare thriving oasis in an otherwise harsh landscape within the Sololi Desert. Once again, we are in a place that we didn't predict we would be today. Um, it's kind of interesting that our itinerary that we received from our agent has been completely off for most of this trip. In fact, all the information that was vital to us, particularly yesterday with crossing the borders and whatnot, was missing. So everyone else seemed to have the right information. We're in a place right now called the Canyon of the Anaconda. So I assume it's got something to do with the shape of the canyon, the way it sort of swerves. We'll see. Have a look. Since we've been going past these fields of quinoa all day, I thought I'd try a quinoa cerveza, quinoa beer. It's 
it's kind of sweet and tangy. It's almost like a, a wheat beer, but different quinoa. Yeah. God, look at this, Miranda. What do you think? <laughs> so basically, they overbooked the other hotel. They said we need to put you in a different hotel. And we go, oh, okay. And then we look, got, got dropped off here, and this is amazing. I think this is yeah, this is salt as well. All these bricks are salt, mm -hmm. and uh, has a beautiful thatched roof. Amazing. After our final dinner together with some local Bolivian wine, which was actually quite good, we had an early night's rest. The following morning we awoke in the darkness well before sunrise and drove out to a nearby island in the salt flat. From there we hiked up to a high vantage point where we could witness the sun rising over the world's largest salt flat. of Inca Huasi is the remaining top of an ancient volcano which served as an ancient island in a giant salt lake that covered the salt flats roughly 40,000 years ago. The name Inca Huasi means House of the Inca, as the island served as a refuge for the people crossing the salt flats in an ancient past. So we're exploring now the Arco de Coral here in the Ayuni Salt Flats. Laura here was just telling us that these cactus grow approximately about a centimeter per year. So some of these are several meters tall, which means that they are several centuries old. Well, it can be up to several centuries old anyway. It's pretty impressive. So we are on the Ayuni Salt Flats. This is the world's largest salt flat. And this used to be an ancient lake bed up until it evaporated uh, thousands of years ago, leaving this salt residue here on the ground. We have some fun today here in the Ayuni Salt Flats. We had a great sunrise this morning up on that hill and we'll be staying tonight in the town of Ayuni. The consistency of the white ground layer over the 10,000 square kilometer landscape makes it an awesome place to play around with the trickery of perspective photography. Mm -hmm. 
So that was really cool doing some of those perspective shots here in the salt flat desert. It's kind of strange though because I was here back in 2014, so nine years ago, and this place was completely empty and it's become a bit of a tourist mecca now. I know it's been quite famous for a while, but the amount of people we've seen here today, it's kind of like Patagonia. It's just really started to increase in popularity over the recent years. Probably since COVID, a lot of places we've realized have really increased in popularity since COVID. I guess it's all that pent up frustration. Doing a little bit more exploring now. Our guide Hosemar seemed to be the expert at setting up the ideal perspective shots, which were loads of fun to produce. original Salt Hotel and this is where the 2016 Dakar Rally took place. Okay, this is a place I remember vividly from my trip here in 2014, nine years ago, the train cemetery. Few differences though. Obviously a lot of these places have become more popular and we had a whole bunch of sculptures made out of scrap metal down there, including Terminator Predator and the Transformers. And now they have little tiendas here, gift shops selling things. When I came here last time in 2014, there was literally just the old train wreckage, so. Times change. Who knows what another nine years will bring. Relics of the golden era of Bolivia's mining industry in the late 19th and early 20th century, these British-built locomotives have been left in the salt flats due to the collapse of the industry after World War II. Over 100 train cars sit rusting away over time due to the highly corrosive salty winds that blow through the area. Yes, <laughs> one thing we noticed here, this is at the Eucalyptus Hostel, which is quite nice. Um, we noticed that the bed's made of salt as well here. Everything's salt. So the, the ironic thing is the meals have actually been a little bit undersalted, so 
That's the ironic thing. But uh, we're gonna spend uh, a day here in a uni and all a night and tomorrow. We get a, a late bus tomorrow afternoon. We're gonna catch up with some friends from our uh, three day trip through the salt flats and the Alta Plano for dinner tonight. Let's rest off for a little bit. Good food. <laughs> What'd you get, Miranda? Soup. Apparently, you dip the French fries in peanut soup. Nice one. It's a traditional Bolivian dish. Where are we? Kika. In? Uyuni. Uyuni. We've got the Mondongo. This is a, a traditional dish as well. All right, Provecho. In the next episode, we leave the high plains of the Bolivian south and head up to its capital. From there, we continue north to the world's highest navigable lake to an island known as the birthplace of the Inca Empire, also where Miranda gets the surprise of a lifetime when I pop the big question. Thank you for watching this video. If you enjoyed our content, please like and subscribe. And we'd love if you could leave us a comment letting us know what you've enjoyed or what you'd like to see more of. And help us grow our channel, become part of the Global Travel Stories family by sharing with friends, family or anyone you think would enjoy our content. Thanks guys.